All right, no last minute of play today. Johnny, why do you hate fun? What do you mean? I want to know why you hate fun. I have no idea what you're talking about. The 30 about. minutes preceding this show were an argument about the validity of the Marble Olympics as a form of entertainment. What do you mean? Some guy living in his mom's house building tracks and filming it to, I guess, a dumb mass of two million people? Actually, that guy doesn't live in his mom's house. He's from the Netherlands, and he actually is apparently a very nice guy. Oh, really? He hires the guy to do voiceover work for him. Like, he pays him money. Okay. This is just a project for entertainment purposes. See, I think okay. we're forgetting that poker is also a sport. Okay, okay. so, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. okay, no, no, no. Ring the horn. Ring the horn. <laughs> <laughs> That was just supposed to be me putting you on the spot for fun because I thought it would be hilarious. But wow, that got wild. Yeah. What did you say again, Sean? If poker's a sport, then the Marble Olympics is a sport. Poker is not a sport. Poker, poker's not a sport. It's on Sportsnet, it's considered a sport. That's just because the score. <laughs> I, I understand because, why. That's just because the score doesn't exist anymore. No, it's, it's always been on sports. It's now. because it's an entertainment product that people watch. Yeah. Like, I understand why it's considered a sport, but if that's a sport, then why isn't the Marble Olympics? Also, having regularly played poker, I actually like watching poker. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, it's, it's not a sport. Strategy. Wait, wait, so watching poker is fine, watching the Marble Olympics is not fine? Yeah, because, like, at least poker requires some brain power. The Marble Olympics does not. Yeah, but there's at least some entertainment in assigning merit and value to these. Not really. I don't think so. You need to watch them. You need to give them a legitimate chance. All right. Anyways, should we talk about... Uh, actual sports? Yeah, probably. Um, do we have any actual sports things to talk about? I don't know. This has, been a terrible, this has been a terrible week for sports. Our actual last minute of play in the third period. So, two, so the worst basketball game in college, U.S. men's college basketball history happened this past weekend. It's not the only worst game ever that we're going to talk about today. But we're going to start with this one. Number third or number twelve ranked Virginia Tech and number twenty three ranked North Carolina State, the Hokies and the Wolfpack, got together for a game on Saturday in which the two teams combined for seventy one points. The final score of the game was forty seven Virginia Tech to twenty four for NC State. I'm pretty sure, like every like the handful of like junior high and high school basketball games i don't think they've ever scored as low as 25 on a side that might be the worst basketball game like of all time possibly i've gone to games with my fiance like where my fiance is like sixth grade aged sister is playing and at least both teams score 30 yeah that's pathetic mm -hmm. and they're the, they're the 23rd best team in the nation are there any um, like players on either team that could like go in the NBA draft? Yeah, a this couple year? of them. Like who? Uh, I couldn't name anybody off the top of my head. Okay, but there will probably be uh, pick like players off those two teams that will maybe make the NBA next year. Oh yeah, I mean like you have to be careful with that because the transitional rate from college to the NBA is like one percent. Yeah. So there might be a player on one of those rosters that okay. would make that could make the NBA. Mm -hmm. Did they score the twenty tw all twenty four points themselves? I don't know, but at least at least NC State scored more points than the Patriots and the Rams did. Yeah, oh. yeah. We'll talk Combined. about that later. Lots of stuff to talk about. We're going to talk about, of course, AUS and ACAA. Particularly, we're going to talk about hockey, where there's nothing to talk about for men's hockey, but lots to talk about for women's hockey. Uh, we will talk about the Super Bowl. We'll talk about the NFL awards. And a bunch of stuff happening in the NHL because teams have decided that the trade deadline is poopy and dumb and they don't want to do it anymore. Yep. But I think the best place to start off is with the AUS and ACAA roundup. All right. Stu basketball hit the paint this weekend when they visited the Crandall Chargers. And the men won 106 to 103 in overtime, followed by a win with the women edging the Chargers 78 to 67. They finished the road trip in Halifax when they took on the UKC Blue Devils, with the men winning their second game in overtime of the weekend, 106-102, to and the women crushing their opponents, 80-47. to UMB women's basketball dropped their long game this week to the UPEI Panthers, 77-59, to while the men drove their way to a 79-65 to win. Reds men's volleyball dropped a pair of games at Laval this weekend, where they were shut out Friday night, followed by a 3-1 to loss at the hands of Laval. 
The women fared better as they went 1-1 on the weekend, falling 3-1 to Acadia Friday night, up until they topped the Aigle Bleu de Moncton 3-1. UMB women's hockey dropped their Wednesday night game to Moncton 1-0, followed by besting the Mounties 2-1 Saturday afternoon. The men crushed the UPEI Panthers 7-2 Saturday night when they paid a visit to the island. And Stu women's hockey locked down first place this weekend with a St. FX loss. The Tommies won a close match against the Mount A. Mounties 2-1 on Emily Alexic's 30th point of the season when she whacked home a rebound to vault the Tommies to the win. And that is your AUS ACAA roundup. Thanks, Sean. Just one correction there. I, the UPEI and uh, UMB game was at the Aiken Center. It wasn't at UPEI. Oh, was it? No. It was, it oh. was, at, it was at home. Because... I know. Oh, I on the website, that game. on yeah. the website it said it was in PEI. Oh, really? Well, yeah. that's that's wrong. Maybe anyway. they had to host a. It was supposed to be a PEI home game, but it was hosted at Aiken because of rescheduling. Maybe, perhaps. Yeah. I think. Anyways, not that it matters. Either way, they Gar- crushed Gar- it. Gardner's team won. Yes. To the shock of nobody. That's all that matters. Yeah. Hey, they were. Tra- hey, they looked kind of shaky. They were trailing like for like the first half of the game, and then they took over as usual. <laughs> We'll get into the AUS uh, hockey talk here. Reminder that you are watching Overtime Radio on CHSR 97.9 FM, because I didn't intro the show because I was too busy giving you grief yeah. <laughs> to start the episode. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in or watching the web, um, the vidcast on YouTube. All right. Men's hockey, there's nothing to talk about. Um, my favorite thing from this past week was the UNB men's hockey like Instagram being like, hey, we clinched the playoffs, or we clinched the first round by. And me just being like, yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Well, we do have one thing to talk about. Do we want to save that for the end, though? For, oh, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think about putting that in here, because in my mind, it was like local sports. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll talk about that last, because there's a few more things to yeah. uh, digest from that. But... Uh, we should start with what? You want women's hockey? Yeah, we'll start with women's hockey. Uh, St. Thomas is officially the top seed in AUS. Yep. Yep. They officially locked that up on Sunday, although it was functionally locked up before the game against Mount A, but with the win over Mount A, they're now like 10 points clear of St. Effects with a couple games to go. Uh, yeah, it's like six or eight points or something. Like yeah. And, and, two, something and, ludicrous. Enough of the two games that are left don't matter. No, exactly. So I guess the big question for Peter Murphy is, do you bench your top line? I mean, I I think a little bit of rest would do them good, but I still don't think he does. I mean, Cook started yesterday, so you can see that they're making an effort to rest Clark for the playoffs. Sure. So, I don't know. I, th- I think you could see some players j- just get benched for the sake of benching. Well, but- the reason why I'm asking is you get a week off in between, but my concern would be risking injury going into the playoffs more no, than and, yeah. wearing them out. Yeah, and, well, I think when, when you get worn out, you become more injury prone, and I think that's where that... Where, where the idea comes from, and I think he'd be well served to do it. Like his, like he he's been riding that top line all season long. So I mean, you have to be getting tired at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, what's interesting is we're almost to the end of the season here. So like, we are going to obviously next week going to have to discuss the idea behind awards because you, not that I'm saying that it would have an effect, but. I think Henman's probably your MVP front runner. She's leading the conference in goals, third in the conference in points. If you sit her, she might not win. Well, yeah. I mean, it's also a calculation you have to make because you don't really want to take a, an opportunity to win a major award away, especially MVP. Yeah. And I, I think there's also a few other candidates for that. I'm not so sure Henman will win. But uh, this season, like... This is a cumulation of like what the last three, four seasons. Well, when did Kelty leave? Ooh, that would have been after my years ago. Second year. Uh, yeah, it would have been three years ago because she made the roster her first year after she left school, Mm -hmm. and then we celebrate. Then I congratulated her on making the roster again this year in the fall. Okay. So that would have been her second year out. So three years ago would have been her last season. Yeah, and that was the year they made the AUS finals and then lost St. Mary's and then got beaten by Guelph when they went to Nationals. Um, do you think this team is better than that team? Oh, 100%. It's, it's close. It's deeper. I think the thing about that makes a difference between the two teams is that Kelty was playing with a lot of the same players when they were all freshmen. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is probably like the best chance that the Tommies have had in their history of ever like maybe winning a national title. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is where you get into some weird territory because St. Thomas doesn't have an AUS championship. Mm-hmm. 
In fact, the only banners that they have are two old men's banners, uh, 2000, 2000, 2001 AUS Men's Hockey Championship, and a 1960-1961 Maritime Intercollegiate Hockey Conference Championship. And those are the only two banners that hang at the Grant Harvey Center other than one Jersey retirement that I believe is like tragedy related, sort of like the, the um, Mark Jeffrey one for UNB. Yeah, so this is more, that's more important. Like, screw team awards, I think. Yeah, but that, that's where I think you get into some weird territory with St. Thomas is this team's probably good enough to win a national championship. So is an AUS title enough? No. I, I Look, I, I don't think they're thinking AUS title. Well, I the, think I, Everyone wants the big prize. I think you want, like, both if you can. Well, of course. Well, you have to get one to have a chance at the other. Because yeah. the runner-up doesn't get to go this year. Runner-up doesn't get to go, yes. Yeah, so you have, you have to do both. Because UPEI, who just clinched a playoff spot this past weekend, is going to get the other slot regardless. Yeah. So it's cut or bust. Yeah. Um, I think, like, it, national title should be on the minds of all of them. Um, I don't think Henman is concerned about an MVP award as much as she is a national championship. That's I, fair. I, like, it's logical, is it not? It is. I mean, it depends. You like, want it. What but. are your aspirations? If Henman's goal after she leaves college is to play hockey professionally, I think the MVP would look a lot better on a resume than the national championship does because people don't care about college national championships. Who who men, Men's hockey. Who won the U Cup this year? The, uh, Alberta. 20, Alberta. 2018. Alberta. Who won in 2017? UMB. UMB. Who won before that? UMB. UMB. <laughs> who won before that? Um, before that, was it Alberta again? Before that? Couldn't tell you. Okay. Now, we're not looking at it as in-depth as, like, scouts and everything. Are. I think it, I think oh, that oh, no, is on the I, rise I, I understand that, but I'm saying that, like, the actual championship itself is a very, very slow shelf life. You probably can't even tell me who won the Frozen Four last year. The Frozen Four? That's in, U.S. men's Wasn't it hockey. North Dakota? No. No? They that won, they that won was two years ago. They won in football this year. Okay. Oh. No, no, I don't. And that's the thing is a lot a lot of these championships don't last at all. Like, if it wasn't for the fact that for the most part it's been Laval, I probably couldn't tell you who most of the Vanier Cup winners were for the last X years. Yeah. So do you think maybe it's Sean like... Sean probably doesn't even remember who won March Madness last year, and we watched most of it. It was, um... Actually, I don't. I, I th- so maybe it's like it's a situation like... Um, Let's say, uh, like, Philip Maye in his last year. Yeah. Like, you think, like, maybe, like, winning uh, U Sports MVP in hockey probably w- went more, like, paying dividends to him getting on the L.A. Kings farm team than winning the national title that year. Yeah. And I'm not saying that national championship doesn't matter because your performance at nationals obviously would have an opportunity to raise your stock. Jagger Dirk got signed to Utica yep. in the offseason from mm-hmm. X after having a ridiculously good U Cup. Yep. So it's not like it doesn't matter. But for women's hockey in particular, the route from playing Canadian college women's hockey to going and playing professionally is a much shorter road than the road from playing men's collegiate hockey in Canada and going pro. Yeah, fair enough. So, I don't know. I think the individual award really matters. Does it matter enough that Henman would want to not play? If she had a choice, I bet she takes the national championship. Yeah, I think you. I think you probably do too. Uh, yeah. She's not done. She has another year after this, right? No, she's graduating. She's in her fifth. Is she? Yeah. Okay. Al- so, Alexic's back. Yeah. Okay. So, sort of two different shades here. Yeah. But I mean, on the on the flip side, it's Henman's last chance too. Okay. Yeah. So so, so that's what you're going for. Mm-hmm. I still I like honestly I still don't know if you rest them, because like you're you're gonna have like two three weeks in between. Well, how how much would like that drop right in race? Like how close is it? Um, Villeneuve has what like 32, 33 points. Uh, so this year it's not like a lot of other years, and a lot of other years there's usually a pretty clear cut MVP. This year it's a lot more debatable. Catherine Villeneuve, who plays for Moncton, has thirty two points and sixteen goals, so she leads in points, second in goals. Uh, Alexic is at thirty. She's uh, second in points, but like well off the goal sheet because she's mostly a playmaker. Okay. Henman's at twenty nine points, three shy of Villeneuve, but she's leading in goals. Mm-hmm. 
and then Lindsay Donovan's in fourth. The thing that's notable about Donovan, if I'm not mistaken, is that she actually plays defense, and yeah. not forward. Okay. So Donovan's on four goals and 20 points for 24. So she's the fourth highest scorer in AUS for points, and she plays defense. So that's where you get to this thing where I think you have three legitimate contenders for MVP in Villeneuve, Henman, and Donovan. Because mm-hmm. I think that... And we have to take this into consideration. The 24 points for Donovan doesn't look impressive compared to Henman or Villeneuve, but that's 24 points from the blue line compared to 32 or 29 as a forward. So when we talk about MVP, we talk about, like, most valuable to their team. I mean, and it, if, it, if it depends on how you define that. If it's most valuable to their team, I think that we're making a mistake omitting Kendra Woodland from the conversation. Yeah, but Woodland's not going to win. She's not going to win, but I think that you, you need to mention her. Like, she's kept her team in so many games. Yeah, she like, might she might get the Reimer treatment with like the one third place vote. I'm not sure how many. Like, do, that, is it like a panel of people? That I'm not sure how many voters there are. There there is a panel. I'm just she not should sure win Rookie of the Year, hands down. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's not a debate See, for me. And that's my thing is I'm pretty sure Kendra is going to win Rookie of the Year. Yeah, she almost has to. I just don't think she's going to win MVP. I just don't think she will. If, if no, I, I don't think also, so either. Like, but. I think something else that's going to come into play here, and maybe it shouldn't. Hen's in her fifth year. Villeneuve's in her fifth year. Mm-hmm. Woodland's a freshman. Yep, that's true. It, Pedersen and the Hart Trophy. Even if Vancouver yeah. makes the playoffs, Pedersen's not going to win a Hart no matter how good he plays for the rest of the year. Because people are like, well, we have a Rookie of the Year trophy. You do not get to win MVP. Yeah, and I think mm-hmm. Woodland's going to get the same treatment. I think even, so. Even though but. she's putting together arguably an MVP worthy season, she's leaving leading the conference in save percentage. She's third in the conference in goals against average, and with all due respect on the Red, she doesn't play on that great of a team. Yeah, like she might be in that conversation if, like, again, if she wasn't a freshman, but if UMB was even to like. If they were to get one of the like buy spots, like get into like that top tier of the league. And well, I mean, if they got into one of the buy spots, Sarah would have won Coach of the Year. Yeah, that's true. Which she won't now, but mm-hmm. maybe should be nominated. Yeah, at least considered. Yeah, it's well, it's definitely like, I guess. Well, there's no like rookie coach. Like there's no like rookie coach of the year. No. I guess she's not one. Of, like I guess you probably wouldn't qualify for something like that. But like still, like the fact. We said before, like UMB women's hockey is definitely like a lot higher than people were expecting them to be. But uh, yeah, we can debate the whole like um, like MVP and like what it actually means the same way we do with the NHL or any other any other pro sport or any other sport in general. Um, I think we'll save the AUS awards debate for another week, though. Okay, because there is a chance here, like. Moncton has two more games left. St. Thomas has two more. Like, everyone has two games left. Villeneuve could go out and go back-to-back hat tricks to finish the season, and then I think MVP voting gets put to bed at that point. Yeah, that's true. So let's not let's not yeah. stick on this too long. I'm just making the point that, I don't know, if you're Peter Murphy, I think there's a consideration that you bench some of your top players, but if you bench some of your top players, you might take an MVP award away from one of them. Yeah, I'm sure like it might it might be like a collective decision. Maybe, maybe he sits down with both of them and says like, "Hey, like, like where are we at here? Do you want to play? Like, or like what what do you think is like best for the team and everything?" I think I think that that's possible. Um, interestingly enough, talking about a team that doesn't have the option to rest anybody, the UNB Reds. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, so, that's still uh, close. UNB is in fourth place. They're three points behind St. Mary's with two games to go. I think that. If I'm being realistic, it's over. UNB is going to finish in fourth. Yeah. They're probably not going to catch St. Mary's. They could go win-win. St. Mary's could go loss-loss, but I'm just being fairly realistic here. I don't think it's going to happen. St. Mary's also plays Mount A. <laughs> so. It's not going to happen. It, it's not happening. I'm um, sorry. So they got they got home ice. So Yeah, they will get home ice. Th- and based on the standings, it's, again, technically possible for Moncton to go runner-runner wins and PEI to go runner-runner losses and for them to play Moncton. But your first-round matchup in this case is pretty much locked in. Okay. It's going to be UNB at home playing UPEI. Yeah, which I think you want that considering like how like surprisingly tough Moncton has been to handle for them this season. Yeah, they're 0-3 mm. against the Igla Blue, and their fourth game against them this week is at home or uh, is away. Like, Are they actually Moncton. 0-3? Yeah, they've lost all three games to Moncton this year. Oh, my God. Yeah, so they kind of got like they uh, the Igla Blue had their number, 
and uh, UPEI, I think they've probably done the opposite. They've they've been pretty good against them this year, have they not? Well, people thought the Panthers were going to turn a corner because they were kind of gearing up to try to have a good season to host. And then for a while, we were like, well, UPEI is in the dogfight for the for the bye. And then they got to mid-November, and from mid-November to now, they've been four and six. Yeah, not good enough. I also think that they're using th- this year sort of as a springboard because, like, they're they're hosting back to back. So yeah, because the hosting yeah. is assigned two years in a row. So what I think UPEI is looking more forward to is next year. They've picked up a couple of really prominent uh, freshmen, Jelena Gillard, who yeah. I think is the other primary nominee for Rookie of the Year. Um, is the other big name there. And I think, yeah, UPEI is playing for next year. Mm-hmm. They're going to host this year and get absolutely walloped. Yeah, by like either like probably the first or the second. They'll, they'll <laughs> probably, probably Manitoba, yeah. Yeah, they'll probably end up being like the eighth seed or something like that. Yeah, which I think is kind of what they'd expect. What's interesting, though, is they might sort of get the benefit of seeding because the champions all get seeded one, two, three, four. But right now, if you look at the top ten... Um, St. Thomas, I think, is the third-rated champion. So if Stu is the other team that goes, then Stu will probably get seeded three, and then okay. UPEI gets eight. But I think what you're hoping if you're UPEI is, even though I think your odds are pretty bad that you win a game at all, is if St. Thomas gets the fourth seed, you can't be put on the same half of the bracket as them, so you can't play number one. So you automatically move up to seven. So are you cheering for then for um, St. Thomas to not win... I know. I think I think you want St. Thomas to win AUS. I just think you want them to lose the last two games of the season, oh, <laughs> so that they go yeah, okay. so they drop in the top ten when they come back up after the playoffs. They get seated four, oh, so you okay. get seated seven to stay on the other side of the bracket. Mm-hmm. So, which, funnily enough, is the opposite case of what happened the year St. Thomas went oh, to Nationals. Oh my god, that was so dumb. Uh, UBC was seated four, so Calgary had to get moved up to seven, which put St. Thomas in eight, oh, okay. and then they had to play Guelph. Oh jeez, where they got just crushed well it was three nothing still the game wasn't awful it just wasn't good enough but then they got wrecked in the consolation bracket did they not yes they lost every game yeah mm, good <laughs> it happens uh yeah so it looks like umb's first round playoff matchup is going to be cinched in they can play the role of a pretty significant spoiler and i think i know that if you asked them sarah would never admit that she's doing this but a win against Moncton on Wednesday might knock Moncton out. Because there's two games left in the season, and Dalhousie's only a point behind Moncton. But I'm not sure who Dalhousie plays. I know they still have to play St. Mary's once. They play St. Mary's, um, and they play St. Thomas. Yeah, so it's like you, you, you ha- have to win at least one of those. Wait, so Dalhousie you, is still in? Dalhousie's only, Dalhousie's only a point, point behind Moncton. Really? They're also on a three-game winning streak. Wow. Including a win over X. And who, and who does Moncton play the last two games? Um, Moncton UNB. plays UNB at home, and then Mount A at Mount A. Really? Yeah. So they need UNB to win. Yeah. yeah. So oh, like, oh, man. But Dalhousie, well, Dalhousie if, needs Moncton to lose out because there's no way. Uh, I guess that's not true. They need Moncton to lose one of their last two games and win out or for Moncton to lose out. I think it's unrealistic for Dalhousie to expect to beat St. Mary's and beat St. Thomas. Yeah. But winning one of those two games, especially where they're both played in Halifax, Mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. So, like, if I guess if you're Sarah, you look at that last Moncton game as, like, a playoff game. Like, you have a chance to... It's a wild card game. You could knock yeah. Moncton out if yeah. you beat them. And, like, well, that would be a significant... Like, okay, you went 0-3 this year. Like, forget about it. You The one win was when it counted, and you and you got you, to put you, your biggest, biggest threat in, like, the bottom half, like, excluding, like, St. Mary's yeah. X and St. Thomas. You get to put them out. You get to get, like, that monkey off your back. And not even have to play them in an official playoff game. Yeah, and there's and you literally don't have to worry about any possible matchup. Mm-hmm. Now a matchup would be pretty far away to begin with. Moncton's going to be the sixth seed almost for sure, so yeah. they'd have to win their first round series against St. Mary's or or X. Mary St. Mary's could still catch X for the bye. Okay, but they'd have to win their first round series against that team, then upset St. Thomas. But you can just remove the possibility of playing them at all from the table. Yeah, that's true. 
Now, yeah. I, guess, I guess your question, if your UNB is how you want the other half to go, would you rather St. Mary's get the buy or St. Effects? Which essentially determines... No, well, no. it sort of doesn't determine anything. Because this is the thing about it that's weird, is on one hand, you really, really want Moncton out. But on the other hand, you know they're a bigger threat and might be able to take out the third seeded team that they play, in which case then your semifinal match is St. Mary's or X. Because if all the favorites win going forward, you play St. Thomas in the second round. Yeah, there's no true. easy road for UMB. There's no easy road I mean, to it's the an finals. easier road if the sixth seed upsets whoever the third seed is. Yeah, I think that's the only way. And if I'm betting on a sixth seed, I'd rather bet on Moncton than Dalhousie, <laughs> although Dalhousie does have, uh, is like, one, two, and one against X this year, which is not nothing. No, it is notable. I think Moncton's also beat Saint FX. Yeah, yeah. So, and they've also well, everyone's pretty much beat everyone at some point. Uh, unless you're Saint not Thomas. quite. Unless you're Saint Thomas, yeah. where you just sort of beat everyone. But yeah, so I don't know. I, I think you want to remove Moncton from the picture. Yeah. You I don't so. want there to even be a chance that they somehow upset two teams and you have to play them in yeah. the AUS finals. And that Catherine Villeneuve gets three cracks at your hockey team to just absolutely run circles around them. Yeah, because like, you've mm -hmm. already given up a hat trick to Villeneuve this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she... Well, she was held off the score sheet on Wednesday, but like she, she was still everywhere. She had an assist. Oh, she, oh, she actually did? Uh, I'm pretty sure she did. <laughs> Not 100% on that, but e e either way, she still got like eight or nine shots mm -hmm. yeah that was the thing is sean pointed this out the entire game was that villeneuve ended up being like a third of moncton shot total yep oh yeah because every single time she gets the puck in an, an area where you could reasonably score a goal she just shoots it yeah. and she's on both power play units so i think that also helps and oh, she stays up for the entire she, power she play. double shifts power yeah she plays, she yeah. rolls on the wow. point for the first power play and then moves down yeah they, front on the they second. actually play her in two different positions they play her as the like low circler on one and they play her as the point man quarterback on the other unit so literally what happens is the other four skaters will go to the bench or she'll she'll start down low and then they'll get the puck to her when they want to make the change and the other four players on the unit will will go to the bench as she carries the puck out to the point and takes her new position some damn good coaching it's good coaching good system it's mm. Uh, she did not. It was Quirion from Dubuque and Graham was the goal. I okay. thought they'll have had a point, but no. Yeah, so they so that's how they play her. Okay. And she plays two different roles on two different power play units. Mm -hmm. And arguably, she's no less dangerous in either of them. Yeah, no, she... I, I would argue she's more dangerous than Lauren Henman. And and, and it's only because... If we're talking one-to-one, -one, this, if this we're talking year in one -on -one, particular, yes. yes. Yeah. And if Villeneuve's the kind of player where you don't want to play her in a playoff series because she could just up and take it. Yeah, we talk all the time about goalies stealing playoff series, and I think UNB is hoping that Kendra will be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about, you know, a, an offensive player who could win a playoff series by themselves, Villeneuve could do it. It's true. Um, uh, Reds also uh, recruited their uh, first uh, Nova Scotian player. Yeah, so um, we uh, talked to Sarah on... Uh, Saturday after the game and she said that their recruitment had actually been done since around Christmas time and they've been their their plan is to slowly release the names and they started with Jessica Smith is that her name um the uh the Lindsay, Smith. No, Lindsay, Smith. Lindsay Smith Lindsay Smith yeah Lindsay Smith so sorry um so yeah she signed a letter of intent uh she's currently skating with the uh, midget AAA Northern uh Subway Selects and the Nova Scotia Female Midget Hockey League um, and she will be also be joining uh, Nova Scotia's uh, women's hockey team at the upcoming 2019 Canada Winter Games in Red Deer, Alberta. Yeah, which I think is good enough pedigree. I don't know how much that's going to translate to like top tier talent in the same way that like the Saskatchewan Junior League or some of the other big name leagues do. But um, some of her other things. Uh, previously, she was a member of Nova Scotia's under 18 team, which captured a gold medal at the 2018 Atlantic Cup Challenge. Uh, she has skated as an underager on the Nova Scotia team uh, and earned bronze at the 2017 challenge, so the year before. Uh, in 2016, she was also a part of Nova Scotia's under-16 team that also won the Atlantic Cup challenge uh, at the club level. Uh, Smith's Subway Selects team uh, finished fourth at the 2018 ESSO Cup uh, National Midget AAA Championship, uh, and uh, the team is a two-time defending uh, provincial champion. Yeah, so... 
Yeah, so there, Subway, there's pedigree there is the point. Yeah, Subway Selects is, is like that's a team that I remember. Like uh, I knew a few girls in high school that like played on that team as well. Um, it, it's definitely like a program that uh, is definitely built on success. So she's definitely coming from the right kind of atmosphere that Sarah would want. I, I think the critical thing here is that Sarah had to get a couple of um, big signings in because we're seeing the effect of not having optional scratches on a roster. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Because the the Tommies, for instance, using the other team in the city, have been voluntarily scratching a couple of players every game mm -hmm. and still icing a full 20. Yeah. You know, Sarah's in a point right now where Elena Wagstaff's hurt, Emma Dow's hurt, Julia Spitzig is hurt, Jen Bell is hurt. Um, and their roster for the game that they won on Saturday against Mount A was nine forwards and five defensemen because mm -hmm. Jenna Heimer didn't come back after Christmas. She chose to, to vacate her scholarship and not come back to school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, her roster's decimated. And she's missing some of her, like, not not to quantify it, but she's missing a couple of her best players. She doesn't have Spitzig. She doesn't have Bell. Yep. And she doesn't have anyone to take their place. Frederick Sears redshirted for the year. And, like, me and Sean were talking about it before the broadcast and debated actually asking if the team is considered having Jacqueline Purcell you know, their third goalie, who they have been scratching for most of the year, suit up in another position. Oh, if there's really? another position she's competent enough to play even a couple minutes to keep your bench players rested. Yeah, like either like as like a, like a, a third liner, like like forward type well, of she, thing? Well, she would be their like 10th forward. She'd mm -hmm. be your, your rolling forward, right? Yeah, okay. you would just put her out there to chew up some minutes. Okay. Hmm. I don't know what's Maybe. the thought. Like, we, we didn't ask the question. We thought about asking about it, but like that's sort of your option if you cannot go into the AUS playoffs missing two of your best defensive players and not running a full team yeah that's true and I like I get that roster size for AUS is 18 skaters and two goalies so like you know you're only technically short four roster slots but that's a lot that's a lot like especially if you end up playing a team like well St. Mary's or X like you're gonna need all hands on deck and that's that's it that that deficit of players is going to grow more and more prominent as the playoffs roll on. And like Sean talked about it before, if you're overworked, you're more likely to get hurt. Yeah. So the longer her roster is in this position, the worse it's going to be. Yeah. Well, and they looked tired on Saturday. Yeah, they, it was an ugly did. game. It was an ugly game, Sarah an ugly said, win. Sarah said as much. You actually have an interview with her that we will make a point of inserting at least a clip of here. Satisfying? No. I, I was... That was an ugly one, and we're not necessarily the happiest. Um, you know, I think right now we're we're playing tired, and we can't we can't have any excuses with this group right now, and we can't take the other group for granted either. Just being um, in the position standing-wise, um, I think we over underestimated them and overestimated our abilities, and uh, which isn't fair because they're a very good team. Um, and we got to respect our opponents, and we have to give our 110 percent every every single shift. And uh, we didn't do that tonight, but there were some really good shifts, and we started turning things around. Um, but uh, not satisfying whatsoever. We just have to be better. But yeah, so like you just heard, she essentially said, you know, they won an ugly game, and it wasn't necessarily, you know, the kind of win that they were looking for. Yeah. Well, and when we asked, it like, I, I assume that people like. We're expecting like a, a basic answer, and and uh, are, are the wins all the same? And she said no. Like you, you can't go into games like that and expect to win. And I, I understand that you're shorthand, but she's right. You can't use that as an excuse. Mm -hmm. um, should we move on to a few more things? Since we uh, yes, we're actually at thirty three minutes, so we should definitely minutes. move on. Super Bowl. Um, no, we got a couple more things with AUS. Oh yes, yeah. um, and, even, and even before we get into the nonsense between uh, uh, X and Acadia. Uh, Maggie McClanahan, who is a uh, fourth-year student uh, or fourth-year player on uh, UMB women's volleyball, uh, just uh, hit a milestone of 1,000 digs. Oh, yeah, she had 1,000 digs. I saw yep. that on Instagram. 1,000 uh, digs. And uh, before we get into uh, the brawl between uh, X-Men and uh, Acadia, uh, Santa Vex uh, women's basketball coach, uh, there was a story here of, of uh, them being suspended 
after a player injury uh, during one of their practices. I have an article from Global News up here. So the coach of the San Francis Xavier uh, University women's basketball team remains suspended as the school athletics department investigates an alleged disciplinary incident that injured a player last week. Uh, Lee Anna Osei will miss a second straight weekend of games as her team hosts Memorial University on Saturday and Sunday in ammunition. Now this was uh, a couple, this is a little bit backdated and everything. So I'm not sure whether those games have happened or not. Uh, Leo McPherson, uh, St. of X's director of athletics, says the player suffered injuries after an incident during a practice that left abrasions and swelling similar to what someone would get from coming in contact with a hardwood floor. Uh, McPherson says uh, he has spoken to Ose with the players, the player and the team uh, as a part of the investigation that could uh, be concluded within a few days. Uh, he says the player has since returned to the team and is expected to play against Memorial. McPherson says the school's first area of concern is uh, for its student-athletes, adding that it wants to ensure activities are conducted in as safely as possible. So did the coach hurt her? Is that the implication? I'm guessing like with like a hardwood floor, maybe like she was like violently pushed to the ground or something like that during a practice by the coach at some point. I have that's this is like as far as like the details I'm not I'm not sure if there's been any updates. Because if it was incidental contact during the practice it wouldn't be newsworthy, right? Yeah. But like it's on global news, so I'm assuming there's gotta be some more to it that Yeah, and if it was just a fight between two players, that would be like a school internal handling type thing. Yeah. Suspending the coach almost seems to imply that the coach is at fault for her getting hurt. Yeah. I'm assuming like maybe we'll hear a little bit more later, but uh that's something definitely uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, but for right now, we'll go to the other um, Santa Vex nonsense. I really don't right want to now. stick on this for very long. Yeah. The only thing I really want to talk about is, first off, this is Bush League. Yeah. Hardcore Bush League. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think that any of the Acadia players that defended themselves on the bench deserve to be suspended. They will get one-game suspensions because AUS rules say if you get a misconduct, you get a one-game suspension. Yeah. Um, just a couple things that I have to say. Um, one, there. so the original video that came out about it was not... Um, the one like that was from AUS TV or the substantial one that was uh, remixed uh, appropriately to X going to give it to you by DMX. Um, ridiculous. But was a uh, video from an Acadia fan from behind the bench where you can actually hear the interactions going on and during of which you can hear uh, Santa Vex coach Brad Peddle uh, say, uh, control your players, Acadia. Um, which is a little bit hypocritical, considering that it's, it's his player that jumped the bench. His player that yeah. jumped the bench. Well, I think, like, I think Acadia kind of had a little bit more to spark the couple fights that went on the ice before then. But still, like, it's Saint of X. Like, the refs had it handled. If you watch the full video, like, there were a couple fights on the ice, but the refs had it handled. And then one guy from X, I still don't know who it is. Um, just decided to go. I know they have been identified. People. I just don't remember who it was now. Yeah, but it makes me lose a lot of respect for Petal, a man who I earned, who had earned a lot of respect for me during the U Cup. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He and, and he's a decorated coach in this league. He's decorated. He, he's a great coach, great system, and very much like Gardner, he runs a, a very good ship. Mm-hmm. And not good enough. It not good enough. Apparently, like you, you can't be encouraging that. And by blaming Acadia, you're encouraging your players. Yeah, you're absolutely. you're saying it's okay to do that because it's their fault anyway. Yeah, that like that that that's what you're teaching them, and and you have to remember the, these guys are still young; they're still kids, basically. And there's a good chance that X is going to nationals again this year as a much lower seed this time, but there's a good chance that they're going again this year. And there's a good chance that they play a Katie in the first round. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, uh, I won't read all the t- all the tweets through, but because uh, we don't have time. But uh, Victor Finlay uh, on Twitter, he is a. Uh, uh, in, but basically, like the best insider that U Sports has as far as hockey goes, he does a weekly podcast on hockey as well. Um, he has a string of tweets, kind of like breaking down the whole situation, um, including uh, well, it has to be solved by Wednesday because Acadia plays on Wednesday, uh, and also they're I think they're considering bringing some outside like third party um, officials to kind of like decide like what the suspensions. Huh. should be so good that that'll end well yeah exactly so uh, it's uh it's an ugly incident and um well i guess probably by tomorrow we will we will know more all right uh we'll talk about the super bowl yeah um it was bad best defensive super bowl in history you stop lying it was bad well it was 13 to 3 you gotta it admire the defense it, on that it, one it was bad who needs scoring the defenses weren't good. The offenses were just bad. Eh. 
Look, I'm not putting in the effort. The players didn't put in the effort. Why should I? I guess, but like, still. Like, do you want to know? Do you want to know the emotions about this game the day after? Just sadness. Just sadness. At least, good thing we bought some of the best pizza in the city. Yeah, absolutely. You got to enjoy something over the three hours we wasted. Yeah. yeah. Watching this miserable excuse for a game. Yeah, we definitely nailed it on the snacks. That's for sure. <laughs> It's Nachos just, and all dressed chips. Chocolate covered chocolate. raisins, man. Oh yeah, those were good. You're lucky. You got to leave early. You you, you <laughs> yeah. didn't have to finish it. No, I I no, I was doing paperwork at work while I watched the last two minutes. Oh, uh, I'm no. going to be totally honest. At a minute 14, when the Patriots kicked the the last field goal of the game, I had an option of watching the last minute 14 or going to take a dump, and I went to the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't As wanna, any rational person would do. You didn't want to watch Tom Brady cement his legacy any further? Okay, so this is my biggest problem with the Super Bowl. It isn't the Patriots winning. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to make this clear to Patriots fans. When I hate on the Patriots for winning, it's because you win all the time, not because I hate the Patriots. It's the same reason that I rag on the Penguins when they make the Stanley Cup final or the Blackhawks. No one wants to cheer for Goliath. Nobody wants to cheer for Goliath. Except the fans of Goliath. My issue with the them... Here's my thing. When they won... The game against Atlanta, the greatest comeback of all time, Brady's fifth ring, it cemented Brady as the greatest player of all time. Mm-hmm. If, there were, if there was any doubt before then, there was none after then. Yeah. What has this Super Bowl changed? He's six is bigger than five. Yeah. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. Brady was already going into the hall. Same with Belichick. The Same, only yeah. person who maybe benefited from this is Edelman now has a second ring and an MVP. Okay. Which might be enough to get him into the hall because his numbers aren't that great otherwise. Okay. Did he not win the MVP the year they beat Seattle? No. No? No, he didn't. He, he, who was it that stopped, who, who um, intercepted the, the Wilson uh, pass? I can't remember. It now. wasn't Edelman. No. But I know, yeah, but like, that's where my point is. And people after the game, and I get why pundits want it to be this way. Because they want to try to make it seem as if there's something redeeming about this game so it doesn't seem like a hollow victory. And sorry, Patriots fans, but it's a hollow victory. Is all the pundits were like, well, that was a good old school defensive game of football. Well, was no, it not? No, it wasn't. Because the defense weren't the defenses were not good. There was one good defensive play that entire football game, and that was McCourty stopping the Cooks touchdown. Who and who who's the like McCourty was a player from the Patriots that ran back to the end zone and knocked Brandon Cooks when he was catching the ball. Oh, okay, okay, right. That right. was the one good defensive play. Mm-hmm. There were a couple sacks from the Patriots' defense, but... Yeah, they, they got to Jeff Goff like four four different times. Jared Goff. Or Jared Goff, yeah, sorry. I know, it, it sounds like it should be Jeff because of the names. Anyway, it doesn't yeah. matter. Um, be, well, part of that, a lot of that was Goff not making good decisions with the ball. Oh. Liter- liter- literally having rookie feet in the Super Bowl. Yeah, and that's when an experience team like the Patriots does. Yeah, I know, but it's not, it's not like their performance was particularly notable. It just sort of happened. I guess, but like... And, but, and the thing is, two of the most telling moments were the Rams don't convert a third and six in the third quarter, and Tony Romo can be audibly heard on commentary saying, well, this is just sad. Really? And I, then in that, I, missed, I missed that yeah, part of the game. <laughs> and, then in the same, and then in the same quarter, the commentators that were covering the game for NBC legitimately said when the score was 3 to 3 that they thought the MVP award for the game should have gone to one of the punters. Yep. By the way, Johnny Hecker actually probably would have won it if the Rams had won the game like 6-3 or something cuz you know, he broke a Super Bowl record and actually had a really good game. Which Super Bowl record was that? Uh, longest punt. Longest punt in the Super Bowl. He broke it cuz oh, he kicked okay. a 65-yarder. Longest okay. punt. And how many times did he pin the Patriots? Like 3 or 4. 3 or 4? Yeah. 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 And like like he was the only person on the Rams who did their friggin' job. Yeah, and like I, if Go- and part of the reason why is because he missed. But if Goskowski had hit that first field goal and had gone three for three, he would have scored more points than everybody else in the game, and probably would have won MVP. Hmm. I don't have a problem with Edelman winning. He had 140 yards on like 11 receptions. That's a perfectly reasonable stat line. Was he the only and a heck of a lot better than everybody else? Was he the only player with over 100? Was it passing yes. yards? Yeah, he was the only player with more than 100 receiving yards. Gronk had 97. Sonny Michelle didn't even break 100 rushing yards. Yes, he did get the one touchdown, but... Mm-hmm. Do you want to go through some of SB Nation's uh, top... Uh, or seven reasons why this was the worst Super Bowl ever? I mean, I don't think I need to go... Okay, before you go through them, mm-hmm. let me see how many of them I can guess. Okay, okay. Um, 
Low school. Neither team did anything effective on offense. Nobody scored. Uh, yeah. So the, that's that's the first two. That's the first two. So the first one is that uh, the Rams' offense was painful to watch. Dot dot dot. Painful. Uh, the second one was uh, it wasn't just the Rams though. The Patriots' offense was also bad, though its numbers weren't as spectacular as spectacularly dry. Um, one of them somewhere on the list is that the halftime show was awful. Yep. Absolutely, because uh, um, Adam Levine couldn't sing any song correctly. Yeah, oh, well. he has the pitch of a dog whistle of a voice. They censored um, Travis Scott. Travis Scott, but didn't censor Big Boy, who very clearly led his verse with the N word yeah. on national television. <laughs> Big yeah. Boy was also terrible. Yeah, Adam Levine looking like the one the, guy, the white friend at every black party. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. and like just desperately trying to fit in with this carnival of entertainers they had lined up. All of the like graphical effects from the show were terrible. The the friggin' paper lanterns thing. You couldn't was, see it with all the phones, like all was, the lights in the Yeah, phone. it was yeah. dumb. It was awful. Yeah. It it was legitimately maybe the worst halftime show. And it could have been a reprieve from a terrible game. I realize that like most of us in the booth aren't like huge fans of Maroon Five, but they're a popular band. They can put on a competent concert. I yeah. was I was talking to some fans of either like Adam Levine, Maroon Five, or both, and even they said, "Yeah, that was that was pretty awful." No, there's so. even a headline on Sportsnet this morning. Yeah, that's has does that happen? Does that just happen usually as kind of like a fluff piece or? What about how bad they were? Yeah, I don't know. Associated Press released a thing. Uh, the headlines: Maroon Five Super Bowl halftime show falls flat. Yeah, yeah, it was awful. Well, um, being okay, honest. I want to see how many outs I can get here. Okay, so um, you have three so far. The defenses weren't that great either. Um, hold on one sec. Uh, the defenses... Uh, no. No, that's not one of them. Because um, they, they didn't have to be the offense, which was just bad. They couldn't execute. That's true. As we pointed out, the defenses were not good. The offenses were just bad. Okay. Um, I don't know. Give me the other, like, four. Okay, so number three is uh, even the winning touchdown was deeply boring. Oh, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, so Sonny yeah. Michelle runs it in from the one after a 29-yard Gronk reception that if he literally gotten, like, another four inches would have been, like, a highlight real touchdown. Yeah. Um, it's number five, the biggest drama of the whole night was probably figuring out how long the national anthem was for prop betting purposes. <laughs> I mean, I missed that because I showed up like five minutes later. Yeah, exactly. We don't even remember that. <laughs> so, um, number six, the Patriots won, which is the most boring thing that can happen in any Super Bowl this century. <laughs> I okay. So I don't like that the Patriots have won so much, but like I don't have the same hatred towards them that most people do. I sort of play it up because we're because I'm a Texans fan and we're both in the AFC. And these last couple of years, the Patriots have been the team to knock us out of the playoffs. But like, okay, eh. Okay, um, this is something I described to you as I was uh, had you on speakerphone as you were driving to work. Um, it happened in the last like uh, happened in the last uh, couple. Is this minutes Goff's of play. interception? Nope. That okay. happened. That happened earlier in the game. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Rams missing a meaningless feeding field goal with eight seconds left, and it was somehow the saddest thing of the whole night. Whoa, 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 whoa! Rewind. So the Rams kicked that field goal with eight seconds left. Yep. Okay. Okay. It wouldn't have even won them the game or even tied it. <laughs> okay. So here's the thing about that play. When they're down by 10, they had to kick a field goal and score a touchdown yeah. if they were going to even tie the game. I think what they were saying on the broadcast was like, you kick the field goal and then you get the onside yeah, kick. Yeah, essentially you kick, an, you kick the field goal, then you kick an onside kick. If you recover the onside kick, you get one Hail Mary at the end zone to tie it. Mm -hmm. Which I, which is definitely what McVeigh was thinking when he kicks that field goal. Yep. Yeah. But realizing that there's only eight seconds left makes that all so much more sad. And yep. that them missing that field goal when their only way of winning was an eight second miracle in a thirteen to three sleeper that was more effective at making me tired than friggin' Nyquil. <laughs> I think is the most poetic way. Like that shot is the most poetic way to describe the entire game. Yep. Pretty much. It was a bunch yeah. of meaningless football 
by with uninspired performances where the guy who won MVP only won MVP because there was literally no other choice. Nobody else cracked 100. Was it passing or rushing? Passing, well, receiving. Because it's Edelman, right? Receiving yard, yeah. Because Brady technically cracked more than 100 passing yards, but yeah. who gives a crap? As, as was pointed out, his performance was extremely pedestrian. He threw for 292 yards, no touchdowns, and interception. Yeah. And, like, everyone from, like, Maroon 5 in the halftime show, everyone that was involved in that, and to the players on the bench, looked genuinely disinterested in this entire game. I'm extremely happy that we're going to spend 17 minutes on the Super Bowl and spend 33 minutes on AUS, because that's as much time as this game deserves. I don't, like, if it weren't for the fact that we are required effectively by means of having a sports show to cover the Super Bowl, I wouldn't have even talked about it. Mm Mm-hmm. I was serious at the beginning when I was just saying it was bad. It was bad. They didn't put in the effort. That's legitimately how I felt. That was going to be my intro to the show. It was going to be, screw the Super Bowl. We're not talking about it. If they don't want to put in an effort, why should I? Fair enough. Yeah. Like, it was this close. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because that's how it felt. Did you enjoy any part of that football game? I enjoyed the 20 seconds of the uh, Spongebob clip that they played during the halftime show. Yeah. That's except that, except yeah, that, that they the Im- except that they'd implied leading up to the Super Bowl that they were actually going to, that Maroon 5 was actually going to play that song. Because apparently Levine is also a Spongebob fan. Yeah. And then they reneged on doing that for whatever reason. Yeah. I'm going to guess rights was probably the reason, but... Um, may- what Who sings that original song? I don't even know who sings oh, that. I don't know. Is, uh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, instead they go into sicko mode, which was very... Which poorly. was performed very badly. Yeah. yeah. No, he's Travis Scott is not good by. And like all like I said, <laughs> everything about it was terrible. Like even the attempts at like cleverness in like lighting design and stuff were bad. Whoever yeah. designed the stage clearly did not consider the ramifications of the stage being an end. You have to like basically take a lap to get to the other side of the stage. <laughs> they lit up the center of the M where like the V would be in pink. Get it? Cuz it's maroon 5 and V is 5. Yeah, although you could barely see it. Yeah. Also, like, who's going to see it except the above camera? Yeah, it was super uninspired. And, like, they did, they had him do Girls Like You, which is fine. I guess that's their, like, big hit right now. And they had him sing it to the camera when he's performing a live performance for 70,000 people. Yeah. When they, and they, he was and they, and they had him point. do the spinning thing from the video. That must have looked so awkward if you were watching it in the stadium. We, yeah, which only, yeah, which only matters to the crowd at home. We talked about this when Alessia Cara had her Grey Cup show. Whoever's producing these things better never get a job again. That's fair. I wonder if it was no, the same true. people. Could you imagine? Because, like, here's the thing with Alessia Cara's show was at least her singing was passable. But the production of that show yeah. was awful. Mm-hmm. Just atrocious. Bad song order, bad lighting design, bad everything. It was they, more awkward than watching uh, um, Shania Twain try to navigate... Um, like f- a frozen stage covered in ice in platform boots. <laughs> but like Levine's show was terrible in addition to all of the problems that Kara's Grey Cup show had. Yep. And if you if you literally were just like, you have to watch one of these. Like you have no choice. You have to pick one of these to watch. I am never watching that Maroon 5 halftime show ever again. If you had to choose between like watching the game itself and the halftime show, which one would you pick? I'd rather watch the game. I'd rather watch the halftime Damn. show because it was only like 15 minutes. See, that, see, that's my line of thinking. Yeah, at least exactly. it would be over quicker. <laughs> oh, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> but at like, least I'd have time to like not waste three hours of my life. You want to know what? Points to mad props to Johnny Hecker. His punters are people too. Clothing line probably got a huge bump in sales given that he was the best player for the Rams. Absolutely. I'm done with this. Can we please move on? Yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, let's one go. more one more NFL thing. So NFL awards, we can just run through the uh, um, Patrick Mahomes wins MVP and Offensive Player of the Year. That was expected. Offensive Rookie of the Year, Saquon Barkley. Defensive Rookie of the Year, Darius Leonard. Uh, Defensive Player of the Year, Aaron Ronald. Um, Walter Payton, Man of the Year, Chris Long. Or yeah, Chris Long. Yep. Um, Unstoppable Performance of the Year, Jared Goff. Um, that's obviously decided before last night but whatever <laughs> yeah and it's like the thing with the nfl awards this year is like everybody won the award that you expected to aaron donald winning defensive player of the year was up for debate people were talking about jj watt who also had another very who had a very very good season mm-hmm. the other one was rookie of the year where of course i think of note baker mayfield but like baker mayfield was a bright spot on a surprisingly good browns team mm-hmm. saquon barkley was the only bright spot on a surprisingly terrible giants team fair enough um, clutch performance of the year? What do you think it is? Brady. No, Miami Miracle. 
Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That's good. Well, I mean, that one does include Brady, just not the way he'd want. Yeah. Um, Aaron. They pointed that out during the Super Bowl. All five of the Patriots' losses this year were to teams that didn't make the playoffs. Oh, really? Yeah. And on the road. Yeah. I guess the crit- that kind of validates the criticisms, although playoff Brady. Also, for the record, all the people out there are claiming that, you know, the Patriots were the underdog because people wrote them off at the beginning of the season. No. We wrote you off because Edelman was on a four game suspension and you started the season two and three. Yeah. Not because we didn't think you couldn't win a Super Bowl. Mm hmm. Anyway, we've got like five minutes left. Okay, so, so Aaron Ground players, uh, Mahomes and Barkley, uh, Sports and Shit Award went to uh, Drew Brees. Uh, Game Changer Award went to Shaq Queen Griffin. Uh, Coach of the Year went to Matt Nagy. Um, yes, Griffin's the amputee, the guy who's missing an arm, who's playing for the Seahawks now. What? Yeah, he got drafted from Central Florida. He, How does he play? He has one arm. He's a linebacker. He has one arm. His arm's cut off, cut off at the elbow. So how does he catch? Or he's, he's a linebacker. Okay. Yeah. Well, he still intercepts the ball, but he catches them by pinning it against his stump. He's actually one of the best defensive players in the NFL. It's wild. That's crazy. Go How's watch that? go go watch his highlight reel from UCF. Just do yourself a favor and go on YouTube and watch one of his college highlight reels. Kid's insane. Okay. Good for him. Yeah. Um, celebration of the year, uh, Seattle Seahawks for like some kind of weird dance they did yeah. in the end zone. And uh, comeback player of the year is uh, Andrew Luck. Which he definitely should have yeah. won because, God, was he bad last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so how, how much time we have left here? Uh, four and a half. Four and a half. Um, do we uh, want- I guess technically three and a half. We want to insert the clip of Sarah. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, do we want to just save all the trade talk for ne- for Friday's episode? Um, just in case maybe something else happens. Because it's, it's things I just don't want to kind of gloss over with as a whole. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll save the hockey stuff for Friday. There's yeah. going to be more trades, I think, over the course of the week anyway. Yeah, I think we'll end on this. Um Lakers offer a huge package for uh, Anthony Davis, whose trade, um, the market for him is getting hotter and hotter as the days go on. Apparently, the Lakers offered him, uh, the Pelicans a package of Lonzo Ball, Kyle Kuzma, Rajon Rondo, Michael Beasley, and a first-round pick. So they're two, they're two bench veterans, they're two bench prospects, and they're first-rounder for Davis. Davis, yeah. And I actually don't think it's enough. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. No. Is Davis the best forward in the NBA? He might be. Well, I mean, like, LeBron. I mean, I, I don't see okay. LeBron in the same mold. I'm talking like power forward. Yeah, I mean, like if, if if we're just talking like as a unit, yeah, he probably is. I I would say he's easily the best player out on the trade market right now. Yeah, I think the Raptors should go get him. Well, that's just me. That's actually a perfect segue because I think we can end on this. Like, because I wanted to ask because I keep hearing every day that like Raptors are not necessarily the front runners, but they the potential is climbing day by day that they might get Davis. Between the two of you, what do you think Raptors would have to give up in order to get Davis? Uh, Ibaka, a bench prospect, and Siakam. probably two firsts. Siakam or... I think you give OG. Na- I, you give OG. Is, oh, OG, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you give OG right. over Siakam, but... That, it's probably Ibaka take. so that they get an NBA-ready center slash four that they can play. You have to give them a bench prospect and I think you give them Anu no because I don't think you give them Pascal Siakam after this year. No, 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 no. Um, and then the thing is because the Raptors are, I think, shallower on the actual active NBA side of things, you're going to have to give them a lot more and I think that the asking price is probably two firsts. Okay. So it'd be this year and then two years from now because you can't do back-to-backs. Okay. Is that feasible? Do you think that would be a good idea? No. I think you wait because you don't know what's going to happen with Kawhi Leonard. And if Kawhi Leonard walks, you just take the truck of money you were going to give Kawhi Leonard and you back it up to Anthony Davis's door and you say, let's be real. You don't really want to play in L.A., do you? Apparently he really does. He wants to be with LeBron. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. That's just. But I mean... Who doesn't want to play with LeBron? Everybody Fair wants enough. to play with He'd LeBron. He'd make me a superstar. I mean, like, I'll tell you who doesn't want to play with LeBron. Steph Curry. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and I, th- I think we're good. Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing about this season is that the Raptors really need to re-sign Kawhi. Because if they mm-hmm. gave up, you know, city hero DeMar DeRozan for one year of Kawhi Leonard and they don't win a title, and by the way, if they play the way that they have been playing, they're not going to win a title. They're going to lose to Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. Yep. Not good enough. Nope. Nope. And they need to be better. Last anecdote, MLS Cup Finals in Atlanta had a higher attendance than the Super Bowl. I'm not surprised at that whatsoever. Uh, by about 2,000. It was at the same venue, too, eh? Yeah, both the Georgia Dome. Uh, they were both sellouts. The issue is that the Super Bowl needs more space for media and stuff, so they technically sell less tickets. But MLS fans have been parading that one around since last night. Yep. We're the better football. 
<laughs> I mean, in, in yeah, Atlanta you, this year, yeah, they were. Yep. I mean, like, I'll, I'll be. Let's be fair. I would prefer any game in MLS this year over that Super Bowl. Oh, easily, no doubt. Anyway, that's us here at Overtime Radio for today. We'll be back on the air on Friday from 2 to 3. Thank you for tuning in. We are, of course, broadcasting on CHSR 979 FM in Fredericton. And, of course, webcasts are available on YouTube. If you missed anything, you want to go back, you want to comment or whatever, you can find us on YouTube or Facebook at Overtime CHSR on pretty much every social media platform. Go ahead. Give us your opinion. Don't like our takes. Please let us know. Give us something more to talk about. Uh, But we will see you on Friday.